This episode of Shouts Rules is brought to you by Transparent Sunglasses. Shouts Rules! Shouts Rules! Shouts Rules! Shouts Rules! Very excitable tonight. I like it. I like it. I like it. You must have heard the good news. Well, I'll give you the bad news first. Jennifer Flowers just got fired. Oh. Right? She got fired from her receptionist gig, but don't worry about Jennifer. She already got a new gig as the backup mistress for Donald Trump. <laughs> That's right. If Marla Maples cannot fulfill her duties, Jennifer's going to step out of so Don't worry. We'll do that. Tonight, we got a great show. My guest is Richie Malone from State of Quo. Super excited to have Richie on. If you know me, you know that State of Quo is one of my favorite bands of all time. And Richie is the newest and youngest member. So it was great to talk to him about his experiences in the band and before the band, how he grew up uh, loving Quo and um, stepping in to the gig in place of the late, great Rick Parfit. So uh, this is a really, really great interview with you. He's a great guy. So super happy for you to watch this and share this with you guys. All right, here we go. How you been doing, man? Good to see you, and thanks for doing this, man. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. I've been hanging in there, as they say, over here. Not yeah. as much crack as we'd like to say, but it's, you know. It's so, something down. So what's the scene there? Are you going out a lot? Is it masked? What's, what's the deal? What's it like? It's, I've been doing a few interviews lately and it's been funny because it, it, obviously this is the topic of conversation now. Sure. Um, and for me, or from what I noticed in Ireland, it's like it's two steps forward and 10 steps back, you know? Uh, yeah. So it, it, as we were happy when the pubs opened as long as you, uh, you had to have a bowl of soup and you could get your 15 pints of Guinness in, yes. you know? <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's a nine euro meal that's that's the deal here you have to spend nine euro on food and then you can drink as much as you want really <laughs> wow okay so, so the, the the wet pubs as they're called which are pubs that you know don't serve food right uh they don't get to open they've been closed since uh before saint patrick's day so they get to open i think it's all gone well 21st of september okay so oh. that means being able to just walk into a pub and have a pint. That's it. And so. eat without food. Yeah. Wow. Praise that's, the Lord. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's been a, uh, that's a law here. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. And, you know, it depends on what state and even what city or county you're in over here. They all have different laws. And Nashville has a thing where bars do have to serve some kind of food. It can be a microwave pizza. I mean, yeah, that, I that, that can also work. And some have worked out deals with food trucks. Uh, and that's been the thing. If the, I think if your bar is t typically more considered a restaurant, you've been okay to open. It's really confusing. The whole thing is confusing. What has been here. <laughs> we can't seem to, like you mentioned, steps forward and steps back. We can't yeah. seem to get those steps forward. Okay, you just we're keep having, going back. You were having trouble getting like a little bit, you know, and they'll try some things. And the shots downtown, like lower Broadway, where all the honky tonks are, and it's kind of the touristy area of Nashville, you'd think it was, you know, spring break or something. Really? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, yeah, I live yeah, kind yeah. of far away. I live like, you know, a little bit out of that. So I never go down there. Yeah. Unless, stay unless in your showing, bathtub yeah unless i'm showing family or something well here it is you know and i have friends in town so yeah i yeah, never yeah. do go down there but um but man what a great room you have yes this is the as we call it the man cave you that know, is this fantastic. is my that's uh we i have this to just escape from the kids really i just had to make it look good yeah <laughs> well it looks great it looks awesome <laughs> thanks so, uh, so yeah, family doing okay. Everybody like kind of doing well. Yeah, it's it's the kids all started back in school uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you know within forty eight hours there was head colds galore, runny noses, coughs. We haven't had a single cough in the house since February. 
January, good, you know. Good. Yeah. But obviously now, if you have, if you even so much as cough, you know, in a pandemic, you know, <laughs> like yeah. this, you know. Yeah. I can't. I, I, I'm the type of dad that um, if I'm with my wife Jess and we want to go somewhere, I said we can't go into a cafe because if the kids start coughing, I have to leave. I just have to go. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm yeah. terrified of other people, you know having an opinion or looking at, you know. So. Yeah, even if it's just, you know, you yeah. swallow a piece of bread wrong. Okay, it's like people are going to flip out. And, <laughs> I'm choking, I swear. It's not COVID. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Heimlich maneuver, not a not a mask will help me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. But no, it's been, look, it's it's been okay. You know, they're, they're, uh, Jess is happy that the kids have gone back to school. It gives her some sort of normality in her life again. Yeah, you know, yeah, we got, we got, we got married in end of February and she's basically, <laughs> she's been in lockdown ever since. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. That's the cooker time for you too. It's like, it's like, it's like yeah. right, here we yeah. go. Yeah. I really love you a lot. We're going to, we're yeah. going to, we're going to test this. Yeah. We're going to make it happen. Yeah. So <laughs> it's been a real test, but look, it's been fine. We've, I, again, I said it on, on a previous interview that we've had Metallica Mondays to get us through a lot of it. Um, yeah. they were, they were, have you seen that or heard of it? It was, it's been brilliant. Yeah, they were great. They yeah. did. Hey, so did the, did their drive-in show, was that worldwide or was it America? No. Damn it. No, it wasn't. I didn't, wasn't. I didn't get to go either. I had a no. gig and I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't go. And I was so bummed about that. I even, yeah. I was going to buy tickets for it. And then I had the gig, so I couldn't. Then my friend called and he won tickets and couldn't go. So I had a yeah. way in. I was I really like <laughs> I like what they always do, things like that. Yeah, yeah, they've been on the ball. They've been, they're really. I know that look, the bigger they are, they're a big metal band, and but I think they're obviously going to get slated by a lot of people. But there's nobody close to them, you know, to be able to play heavy metal at that level, at that yeah. at that height of your fame, it's incredible. But I yeah. think management wise, they're definitely they're thinking ahead. Um, it's, sure. it's fantastic. And S and M too has just come out, so I spent Saturday night watching all of that. It was great. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, I gotta so, check that out too. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, as far as like you know, people slaying them, they're, they're, people are gonna not like <laughs> anything. Yeah. I mean, they can. I know. I know. It's ridiculous, but I do yeah. love the fact that that they are probably like you. you they're on like another level of yeah fan size, right? And the fact that they still have like a rehearsal room and a band like a garage kind yeah. of I mean, it's a nice one but it's yeah. still they still go there and still jam and still do that stuff it's still like they're they're kind of still that same band I yeah, love well, I, yeah I, and I, I have to I know Lars gets a lot of a lot of stick as we say and he gets a lot of uh, negative vibes but I think if he if he didn't have that level of rehearsals you know it, it's it's not an easy gig you know and I think it no. can only be Lars when you hear Lars playing I know sometimes it can be sloppy I know it's not, you know, there's a million and one better drummers, but if you put someone else in there, you'd hear the difference. It has to be Lars, in my opinion. It has mm -hmm. to be Lars and those guys chasing yeah. him to sound like yeah. Metallica, yeah. totally. Yeah. yeah. So did you hear about um, in Nashville in 2007, before they played Bonnaroo, they did this tiny show at the basement? No way. I was there. It was like 150 people. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they put out they put it out on a tin inch. It's called Live at Grimey's, really? and um, my friend Mike Grimes, Grimey is um, kind of the Rodney Bingenheimer of Nashville. He's like rock and roll impresario, like you know one of the and a great guy too. Record store owner and a venue owner. So there was a Metallica fan club thing that night, and it was super secret. But I got in on his list, and they played oh. like an hour, and it really was like a hundred people, hundred twenty people in the thing. And was it packed tight, or was it kind of, was it a big space? Or it was, it's a tiny place. The venue is <laughs> called the basement, and it's really like a basement. It is when it was beneath his record store, and if you got hundred fifty people there, it was it was packed. It was packed, yeah, yeah. Regardless, yeah. so it was a little bit less than that. Plus, everybody was squeezed up to the front. Of course, and it was really it was. Fucking Metallica. In the and what, what were they like? What was I know that when they're on the big stage, you have a lot of tech and a lot going on. So was it was it kind of them stripped back, or was it still quite polished? Yeah, uh, no, they each had um, uh, 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 shit. Kirk had a, a full stack, okay, yeah. full stack. Uh, James had a half stack and a rolling jazz chorus. Nice. Um, Lars had you know a kit, but nothing like you know a double bass. Yeah. Everything he needed. Uh, they did bring in extra PA and had their sound guy run it, and it sounded fantastic. That's good. Yeah, so yeah, it yeah. was, um, yeah, but it was, it was just, 
watching Metallica on it. I, I played that place <laughs> a million times. Yeah, that's and cool. And it was so cool watching them like, oh my yeah. God, this is so cool. <laughs> I swear yeah, I'm on good. the back. I swear I'm on the back cover. Really? I swear it's some kind of a, store, a distorted image of the crowd. I'm kind of like, there's a blonde blob. <laughs> Just a blonde like mess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be anybody, but it's me. <laughs> That's me. But so, so we met in, at Vakken. Yes. In 2017. Yes. I have the poster somewhere. I don't know where it is. Yeah. And oh, we're, there. We're, yeah, and we're both on live records from that day. Yes, I think that's it there somewhere. Yeah, it there somewhere. Yeah, yes, uh, that's right. Yeah, it, I I can still remember. I think you walked into our dressing room that day, <laughs> and and correct me if I'm wrong. The, what got me was, did you say something about playing Quo in the states in some kind of a tribute band? Was that? Yeah, yeah. Because I I <laughs> I was blown away by the whole day as it was, and then in comes these other like you guys, more rock stars, you know, coming in. Hey, is Francis about and. And you're, you're telling us that you were playing in a, a quote tribute band over there, and myself and Leon, the drummer, just couldn't get our heads around that. Yeah, like, we, uh, there's not a there's not a market for status quo in the states. I don't a quote tribute band. I'll never forget. I walked in the truck. I stopped Rhino and told Rhino what was like. Me and these guys are in a in a quote band, and he looked at me like I was from Mars. And he goes, "Stop right there. I gotta go do this thing. I'll be right back." And that's when he called us into the to the to the trailer. And you guys were about to go on. Yeah, like, yeah. It was, was, yeah. Was like, you guys you sure? It's like, come on in. Never forget it. Francis was to my right. As soon as I walked <laughs> in, also looking at me like I'm from Mars. And Get he, that he, haircut. He's like, he's like, well, yeah. He's like, what's this about an American Quo tribute band? And I said, well, me and the guys just love the music. And, um, you know, the one guy that plays you is not here and, and all that. And he's like, yes, he if we have any gigs. And I said, well, we had some sweat some holes in our schedule. But it, you know, he looked at me like, cheeky fucker, you know. And, uh, <laughs> it was just great. And the whole, I, was just, I was almost as excited when I heard that Quo was on the bill that day that wow. I was when I heard I was playing it in the first place. I was yeah, like, yeah, I'm going yeah. to play it, and my favorite band is playing yeah. it. Too. That, was just, that was such a great day. It, it, it really was. It was, it was. I know, like, obviously, I'm only in the band a few years, but... I'm watching the other guys' reactions to lots of stuff as we go through a European tour or wherever. Sure. And to see Francis's take on all this, he would say, Bleh, all this. Yeah. He, he didn't, we were, we were being interviewed about that gig for months in advance. And he hates that. Like every, we all do because it, it's bigging up one show and putting all that extra pressure on you. Sure. We're out doing all other, other kinds of shows. It could be anything, but, oh, what's, are you looking forward to whacking? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, they were even asking in interviews, um, so what are you going to play? And <laughs> Francis, in some interviews, we say, we're going to open with some Pink Floyd. And we might, you know, we're going to play Status Quo, obviously, you know? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. And, and are you going to play, are you going to play really loud and heavy? <laughs> it's like, we're going to do what we, what we do when hopefully it, it comes across years. well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was, but it was really good. And, and um, to have it documented, you know, on DVD and, and to have all the releases come out around, it was fantastic. But it came and went so quick. Just the whole day came and went. Um, but it was so amazingly uh, organized. That's what blew us away. Everything. Yeah. There was branding everywhere. There was branded toilet paper. We're whacking on it. You know? I know, but that skull head <laughs> is on everything. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. So I was, I was clamoring to see you guys as sex. I was just dying and... And uh, so those above, like the side stages, yes. those, those, yeah. those were all full. And fucking Sabaton had tanks everywhere, and you couldn't get <laughs> a good, you couldn't get a good spot to see anything. So I wasn't gonna go out front. I was kind of like, yeah. What are we no, do? it was good. I think I think we I, I, we went on after Europe. I think, as I seem to remember yeah. saying, I think I hear the final countdown out there. And if you were, if I was up on stage, I'd be getting really nervous. But it's amazing how. When you don't know anything about what's going on the, on the day, you're only focused about your slot. Yeah. And I, as growing up, I was always thinking, I can't go on after that. How can I go on after that? But if you, you don't know anything that's going on and you're just you're in your own zone, so you're psyched up. So years ago, I'd be freaking out about something like that, you know? Well, I'll tell you how you follow Europe. You go play status quo songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The opposite. The, yeah. <laughs> but as Rhino said, it, it, as, as, well, at that one particular concert, it's a metal festival, I and mean, when a band like Quo come on, it gives everybody's brain that 45 minutes of just to give everyone a rest and just let you nod your head and appreciate, you know, foot to the floor, boogie rock. <laughs> hey. 
everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Does It Pick Slide. Folks, we got a great one for you today. We're heading into the kitchen, and we're going to test out a cheese grater. <laughs> All right, you ready? <laughs> Let's go. Well, I believe that's what the kids call a no-brainer, right, studio audience? <laughs> that's a resounding yes, a cheese grater does pick slide. That's all the time we got today, folks. We'll see you next time. Yeah, but I, I get it, and especially in your, ho in your homeland, yeah, you had to be king. So growing up, you must have been. A, I know you had to be a huge monster fan. I was, and I, I know, and I know a lot of people have heard it before. But like, but uh, I, I was kind of. I know it sounds wrong when I say it, but I was kind of doomed from the off because I was named. I was named after Rick Parfit. So my dad, my dad called me Richard after Richard Parfit. So oh, it's passed down. Your dad was a big fan, and yeah, yeah. So he and he still listens to them today and all that. But he. Uh, he was a mega fan, so I had no, I had no real escape from it as, as I was growing up. Right. Where it, it'd be like a, if you were in a, a house where everyone's into football or soccer, as you guys would know it, and it's sure. your dad is into one team. Most likely, the children are probably going to grow up following that team, yeah. you know, right. or hating them, one or the other. One of the two, yeah. <laughs> one of the two. So I was very lucky that I didn't go the opposite direction because who knows what path I would have went down. But I, yeah. he took, he took me to see Quo when I was thirteen, and. Um, it was from just from that. That was my first proper live music experience. My first concert I ever went to, and oh. it was Quo. So, you know, it was it was one of those moments. I can still I can't remember shows from last year, but I can remember that show. You know, I can still remember part the lights going down and and Rick kind of walking out and and just going into it as he does. It was incredible. I, nice. I really wasn't expecting that live atmosphere. You know. Yeah, but yeah. That, yeah. Was, that was the journey that it set me on for the next decade or so of of following. Um, Quo around wherever we could, myself and yeah, So, how did you get on their radar, and how did they know you? How did they begin to know you as a musician yourself? I think um, I used to love chasing the bands. You know, love seeing the the stage trucks and seeing the tour buses. That always still does. It always fascinated me. And so, I'd be hanging around the stage door, and you'd be trying to get a glimpse. And the more and more I kind of met Rick at the stage door, the more kind of, you know, you've only got 20 seconds with an artist, as you know, you're, he's running in and you're trying to go, Hey, it's me again. I haven't seen you since last year. And every time we met, we kind of exchanged a bit more information. He knew I, I was learning the guitar. I was named after him. Yeah. And then he'd see me down the front. So as time went on, that kind of just kept developing as, as into more like a friendship. And he, Rick would kind of see me down there and go, he's really going for it down there. Look at him. And, I was trying to play the air guitar like him, my hands over the barrier, and I'm trying to all play down strokes. Yeah, all down strokes. See, he probably was looking down, going, "Poor little fella, he's trying so hard," you know. <laughs> but it, it was it was just that kind of that innocent approach that um, it just led to way down the line. He'd say, "You're coming in for a sound check," or I think um, the tour manager at the time was sent out, or the guitar tech, or Rhino sometimes was sent out by Rick to bring Richie and his dad in. It was the funniest oh, thing. Wow. So Ryan O would be coming out and I'd be going, fuck, it's Ryan O. Look, hey, Richie, come on, Rick wants to see you. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> you know? yeah. So it, it was, it, there was loads of moments like that over the years, that type of encounter. And then it just got to a stage where he'd be bringing me in. We would have exchanged email uh, details. And um, there was no kind of, can I get a picture with you or can you sign this anymore? I was kind of comfortable being around him. So sure. I think he, he appreciated that too. It wasn't coming in going, oh, Rick, you fucking rock, you know? Yeah. Just, kind yeah. Of just trying to sit with him, have a conversation with him. And even though my dad was crumbling behind me, probably he was in bits. He couldn't yeah, even yeah. hold himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, cool. Keep cool. yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it was just, it was like that. And, and um, I, there's a great clip on YouTube where you see me and Rick jamming together on stage. And my dad happened to capture it on video camera. How old, times. Were, you? How old were you at that Oh, I think I was, geez, I don't know, I think I would have been maybe 18 or 19. It could have been 20, okay. late teens, I think. Um, and again, it was so, it had happened two years previous, but it was, it was, he just said them famous words. We were in a sound check. Are you coming up, Rich? It was just the weirdest thing. We were just sat in, you know, two rows back, just enjoying the band sound check. 
And um, <laughs> Rick just shouts down, you coming up, Rich? I was like, Ugh, to do yeah, what? I what? am. Yeah, okay. And, and he took me up and, you know, and we just, we just kind of jammed about on stage for 15, 20 minutes. And, and that was it. And it's, it's those little encounters that kind of have turned it from being a fan into more so a friendship, you know? Sure, sure. But um, I, I never knew where it was always where it was going to end up. I, I ne- would never in a million years would have imagined. Yeah. You know. I mean, I, I wanted to have you on because we've kind of, I'm sure their paths are a little bit different, but our current place in life and a career is kind of the same. Mm. You know, younger guys, newer got new guy in the in the legacy yeah. band, and you know, with, yeah. with except for me, and also with Gene and Ace. Of course, know, yeah. Like with playing with these guys now. Yes, and, um, which is pretty incredible. If you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it is. It, it's like the same thing with you. Like looking back and going, "Wow, how 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 that?" Because I ask myself a lot of this. I love this yeah. a lot. Like, how the hell did I end up here? Yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. Yeah, but for you, for yeah. like, I, I, mine is quite a unique story. But I, I, mine is like, or for yourself, it's. I mean, I think it's probably similar to Leon, our drummer. You, you, you would have worked very hard to get where you got. Like, I, I was lucky in a way that I was a fan and I did one thing and I, I, I idolized Rick. I focused on Rick's playing. Yeah. Never would have thought it would have got me into the band, but I was focused on that. And, and there's a technique that he has that I tried to, to learn. And and that's that's what got me into the band. But guys like yourself and, and as I say, Leon are superior musicians and you have earned that role, if you know what I mean. So you're in a fantastic position. But you've obviously started off down here and you're worked your way all the way up and you're you're on a fantastic level, but it's earned, you know? Yeah, really yeah. Well is. likewise too, man. I mean, everybody to I think anybody in this in that has got to anywhere, any level of success at all in music has, you know. Busted yeah. ass for it, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. hard work. It's hard work. Yeah. So you mentioned Rick's guitar technique, and I wanted to ask you about this because it's it is all downstrokes, and it's hard rocking, <clears throat> but it's not like Ramones. No, so there's a bounce to it that I never could get when I was trying to do Parfit in our band. Yeah, and it's can you give us an, give me an insight on like how to like how to do it or like what were some things that you it's, kind of did with your, it's it's it head. is yeah it's 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 quite hard to explain um but he kind of has a rhythm that as he as he's as he's playing he's kind of hitting the strings on the upstroke at the same time you know he's it's 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 hard to explain but it's not all as you say punk rock and all down strokes right as he's as he's coming back up there's also a hit going on there to give it that rhythm that there's a rhythm going on oh so, I know you could just say it's all da 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 da, da but there is there is a rhythm technique going on there that <laughs> his hand is moving so fast that unless you slow it down, that's what it is. And I've never seen anybody's hand do that. Yes, it's I, not even mine. <laughs> it's like I love those YouTube shows, like of his guitar video that he did, the demonstrations. Like, yeah, his right hand is insane. I, yeah, I, yeah. When I watch it, I'm like, I don't understand what you're doing, and yeah, I yeah. make that sound. Yeah, like the intro to Caroline is a perfect example. Um, yeah, and there's 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 parts of there's a, there's um, there's parts of the middle sections of forty five hundred times, and and there's a track called One Man Band uh, on the album Rockley Drop, and just as it's coming into the lead solo, that that's if anyone wanted to know what was Rick's style, like One Man Band in that middle section of One Man Band would be you hear that rhythm guitar the way he's playing it. Mm-hmm. And it's only it only lends itself to to that type of music. It it, it only suits yeah. a quo. If anyone else was, it wouldn't has to be a quo song. You know, it, it really does. It really that does. type of boogie rock. So totally totally unique. And yeah. so uh, when I was doing some research today, um, so before you were in the group, your father surprised you with a <laughs> Parfit replica Telecaster. He did when I was when I was twenty one. Twenty one. Actually, that that so when I met Rick, I, yeah, I must have been twenty one when that when that happened then because okay. um, I had just had it built by a guy in the UK, uh, Mike Smith, and we were playing a, a local gig here in Dublin, and um, again for my birthday upstairs in this shithole of a pub, and my dad walked up the stairs while we were sound checking. And he had a cardboard box. <laughs> he said, "Hey, kiddo, I'm after getting you a traveling iron." 
Because <laughs> you know the, when the, the, the triangular shape cardboard box the, that you get the guitar in, and it had no branding on it, nothing. It's like right, right, traveling right. art, and it's something I wouldn't put past them because when we're always traveling through hotel rooms and things get damaged from sure, time yeah. to time, you know, as we were, I think he's probably after buying me a fucking traveling iron now. And and I opened it, and it was the the Rick Parfit replica Telecaster. Now, uh, when I say replica, it was Mike did it. It was a one of a kind because I don't never play that and quite like it. Um, it was down to every scratch, so it was relict like Rick's. And I know a lot of people aren't into relic guitars and all that, but the the job Mike did on that was I just it blew me away, and it was a lot of money at the time. You know, a lot of money. So it it stuck with me ever since. I've got one of those with my dad too. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the early nineties, I was in. Um, I'm about 10 years older than you. And I was uh, march in marching band. I played saxophone. And so I'm in high wow. school. Like, it's like the early 90s. Um, and, you know, early 90s, I was into, you know, classic rock, but also like, you know, Joe Satriani and some things like that, you know. So I had my eye on this Ibanez guitar that was hanging in my, um, you know, pointy and Floyd Rose and all this stuff. Nice. Um, in my friend's shop, right, took guitar lessons. And I had my eye on it, really had my eye on it, eye on it and, uh, the marching band, uh, my high school marching band, we did a contest and we won the contest. We're all on the school bus. Yeah, got it. I looked out the window and there's my dad oh. holding <laughs> this black Ibanez guitar case, knowing exactly what is in it. So I'll, I, I'll never forget that. You know, Brilliant. I still, I, still I, I will always have that guitar too. It's in. It's, uh, never yeah. get rid, I never get rid of that one either. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's pretty. That's pretty special. Yeah. So I, I totally get. The feeling yeah. of him coming in, hey, yeah. you know, that was yeah. great. Yeah. No, that's pretty special, mate. It's, it's, to have those kind of stories really makes it special, really, you know? Yeah. And oh, yeah. that's that's the, the funny story behind that is when I went to do my audition with Quo or my, my rehearsal, is that um, it was covered up in gaffer tape or covered up in yellow kind of gaffer tape for my first show because, you know, I couldn't be walking out on stage people would think it was Rick's guitar. With that, yeah, sure, sure. So, and I, I wasn't thinking that. I just opened the case up at rehearsals and you can see a few people going, oh, fuck, no, what have we done? You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, is, so it, is it with the Quo gear in the warehouse or is it, is it behind you? No, there's, um, I only have, no, it's in the house actually. I have a lovely uh, Telecaster there, which I got built. I was due to take it out on the road this year. Ooh, nice. So it never got to see the light of day. It was gone to this year. And I like you, you use, uh, Rick used those uh, different bridges too, didn't he? Didn't he yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, again, you're asking about how his technique, like I could pick up an American Telecaster with a standard bridge with standard strings and it would sound like absolute piss, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of it lends itself to the bridge setup and the heavy gauge strings. And mm -hmm. once you've got that bit, then it's up to your technique to follow. But um, right. but yeah, that Telecaster is a piece of work and it's, it's really good. Um, yeah, it's lasted the test of time and it's only, a, it's only a, a relic guitar, you know? Yeah, and you built your main guitar. Did you build your main, did you build it? The white one? Yeah, the, the Cobra? Oh, the, no, again, Mike, Mike did that for me. So it's in the house as well. Um, I had... Oh shit. We put racing stripes on it to kind of, to kind of look, make it look like it's my own type of thing, my own design. Yeah. So I got onto Mike and I said, I'm thinking about a new guitar for the new winter tour. Uh, I want it to be white with white scratch plate, but I'm thinking about blue stripes, going with the AC Cobra type design, right. and that's where it came from. So he built it just in time and arrived in rehearsals, literally just in time for the for the winter tour. I think in 2016. Oh, okay. So, that's a great. I, I, I've actually had Quo fans send me messages saying, um, how did you manage to wear down the body like, uh, like Rick did? And I said, I, I didn't do anything. It's my, it's my arm. You know, it's the wristband. They, they yeah, thought I'd relic. They thought I got a brand new. I, I didn't want a relic. I wanted a brand new guitar. So you could relic um, yourself naturally. Myself, over sure. time. But the, people tend to forget the guitar is out on the road for most of the year, for the last few years. It's, it's battered. <laughs> Can to get beat up. Yeah, totally. yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. So, uh, to continue and talk about gear, one of the greatest <laughs> things I think about the, the quote is the white <laughs> backline. 
Yes. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. just it's so great. So what are you, what are you going through? Are you going through, are those, I mean, if, if it's, if this is a secret, I can cut this out. No, so, no, I, I know, I know. No, it's, it's okay to ask. Uh, they are all real is the main thing. They're all on and they're very powerful. Yes. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a mashup up there. It's, it's, it's quite simple in general. It's simple, but, um, what we do is we mix a Marshall 800 with a Vox AC30, and that's what gets mixed for front of house. Okay. But what people don't see, or what they put well, from, if you're not up close, the four Marshall heads across the top, mm. two of them are actually, the Marshall components have been taken out of the head, and the Vox AC30 has been put in, oh. the volume knobs. And what that does is that controls the two Voxes in, in an ISO cab off the back of stage. Gotcha. So that's so that's where we don't, we don't hear obviously the voxes they're blended for front, yeah. but the eight eight hundreds that we have are actually the Kerry King eight hundreds. Really? Uh, yeah. So you know Kerry King's uh, Marshall eight hundred. Yeah. Or sorry, Kerry King's it, it is an eight hundred, but we just have assault and beast mode obviously switched off. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So because you, I don't think we couldn't um, obviously when I joined, the guys had an A and a B rig and possibly a C rig. So um, the Kerry Kings came in to replace the old 800s because you can't get just in case of any failures or you can't just pick up an 800 anywhere you want. Right. Sure. So um, so they're all they're Kerry Kings and there's obviously some some uh, backup uh, heads out the back and the last cab is for Rhino. Funny enough, so when he used to walk across, he'd want to have his base in the wall of Marshalls as well to blend it in. Right. So uh, it's fairly noisy up there. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of. You know, with uh, with except we don't have stage volume. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gene, we did uh, Ace. It Ace's guitar is so loud; it's like it. <laughs> I don't. I don't even walk near the stage without you can, without plugs. In ears, yeah. Because we're okay. uh, only thing with with Ace, we're still on wedges. Okay, so not okay. Yeah. So uh, except his in ears, uh, Ace and Gene were uh, were wedges, and Ace has two or three four twelves behind him in an arc tilted at his head <laughs> and he has one wedge in front of him that's vocals and two are guitar and then vocals and guitar on the side fills i mean it is absolutely wow it, it'll wall knock, of sound yeah it'll knock you down so i'm like nope i have the Jesus. molded plugs and i'm happy as can be about a little yeah but the the it, the accept show at uh, Vacuum that was that was pretty. Like, again, we watched that from up from up in the wings, and it was yeah. it was mega. I still have some videos from it on my phone of shooting down on top. Oh, cool! <clears throat> and must we'll must dig them out and send them to you. Yeah, oh, awesome! Yeah, I love that. That was the yeah. first time um, that I I wasn't even really in the band at that point. I was just doing the little the uh, the classical yeah. session, and that yeah. turned into me doing a tour for the, the classical thing, and that led to me like. Well, you want to you want to join? Like, there you go. Sure. You see, <laughs> yeah, incredible. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been it's been great. It's been great. Yeah. Um, I read an interesting quote from you when you were talking about um, being a being a Rick fan and having the guitar and everything and getting the job in the group. And you'd mentioned that you you know you everything Rick was like you just kind of looked up to him and like that's what that's it. Mm. You had you said you had long curly hair, <laughs> so which you don't anymore. Because which is fine because you're not trying to imitate him. And that was mm. a pretty cool statement. And I wanted to talk to you about, about that because coming into a band like that, you definitely want to honor the legacy and honor the music because that's why you're, that's why you now have a gig is because of the past of the band's past, mm. but you also want to be yourself at the same time. Yes. Yeah. And is it for me, it, it is, it is a conscious thing, but then it isn't a conscious thing. It's just kind of like, I'm that way anyway. So how, what's your take on that? How do you approach those two it, things? It, it, very good question. Um, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Very, very difficult because I had spent so long looking at Rick and not that I was idolizing him on stage at home. I just, when you play that type of, as you say, that boogie rock, that quo thing, you can't help but sometimes sit back in the groove and just really lay into the telecaster. And then, mm -hmm. If I'm out there doing a track and there's whatever a thousand of people there, and sometimes it strikes me that I might look a bit too much, too much like Rick, even though I probably don't. It keeps it. It's one thing that I'm always battling against is 
maybe not have the legs too far apart, you know? And as much as I'd love to really go for it and, and over-exaggerate, and, and I think uh, Francis would, all, would, would is again, is watching that. So people would know, if you, if you see me come into Quo and then you've seen us most recently in Hyde Park last year, the difference that my transition throughout the four years or whatever in the band is trying to find a, a stance or, or whatever, a look that fits in on stage that I don't look out of place, yeah. but also somehow I'm fitting in with the band. So yeah. it's very tricky, but the main thing is just not to, uh, is not to try too hard. That's and not, to, you know, I don't want to go out there and look like the rock star. I know Rick Parfit was Rick Parfit. He earned that role. He was a legend, you know? Right. So he, he, he's absolutely allowed to walk out on the front of the stage and swing his guitar. If you could imagine if I went out and opened the show in the middle of the stage and did Caroline, I'm sure not only would the band members give me funny looks, but the people down the front would say, he's only in the band a few years and he's already getting cocky, you know? So, right. Yeah, it is, so, it is, yeah, with me, it wasn't like a thing like, all right, I'm here, change everything. Yeah. You know, yes, people yeah. would do that. But it is a balance, like with accepting. It is. Like, because you know, Wolf does love me, right on his on his hip, like yes, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything. So that was okay, and I was timid at first because yes. I'm very aware, and I I don't want to be like, look at this new fucking kid, you know, yes. whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want anybody to think that, but even if they do, but I don't want to try to give anybody ammo <laughs> for that thing. Yeah, and yeah. which so it was now it's like as we did more shows, I got used to it. it was it was like okay, it's more, it's okay to go out front. I can't. Yes. Oh, yeah. And you get that. Like, <laughs> for the first few shows, I would find it terrifying to walk past the marshals and over to that side of the stage. And not more so, not because I was nervous about the crowd, it's because of my in ears. I was now, I was now on my own, just on the in ears on that side. So when I'm in front of the marshals, not only had I got it in the ears, I could feel the guitars coming through me. So sure. again, it was a learning curve. I was learning all the time that when I walk over there, Okay, I'm going to sacrifice good sound to now come, you know, for part of the show, go out there, go out that side, and then I'll come back. It's like a magnet always pulling you back over towards the marshals, you know? <laughs> and that's my that's my comfort zone. You know, it really is. I, I really am comfortable when I'm standing right in the middle of the marshals, and you yeah. can see everybody, and you and and it, and as I say, you've got the sound coming behind. But as you know, when you walk away from that, the sound is thin, and it's the whole show just in here and in in. in and you're in ears. Yeah, it, it does so help it to have it moving, makes, yeah. moving yeah. hair. It's but that's, really that's, 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 exactly. And that's, that's the whole idea. That's the, I think the way the band has evolved in the last, it's almost like as if we've had to change to suit there not being a big person like Rick Parford in the band. And the way I see it is it's back over to Francis now. He is the front man. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, people are there, a lot of people are there to see him. So it's more so a band effort now. I, I love it when I see that some nights when he's on fire and he's right in the middle and you have to pinch yourself and go, that's Francis Rossi there and he's tearing into a lead solo. And you can tell when he's really feeling it. And you don't want to look at him and you don't want to smile at him because you put him off. That's, yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You just got to turn your way and maybe, maybe later on that night when we're all on the bus having hot dogs, you go, that was a good solo you did tonight. Really? You know? yeah, 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 yeah. And then just turn away before he tells you to get out, you know? <laughs> but, you know, it, it's been a learning curve and it's a great question because it's it's not some, it's it's a hard task, you know, trying to get into big, as they say, you had big shoes to fill. Um, and I never knew I was, I was going to become a permanent member. I was always just going to, at the start, just do a couple of shows, I was told, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think but, you do a great job of that. And uh, uh, also uh, Richie Faulkner from Judas Priest, I think he's just does an ace job of... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. of being in that band and finding his role, but also respect. totally into the band. Yeah, yeah. There's you know. a level of respect you got to have, you know? It's, uh, sure. and I, it's, there was, there's been a lot of fans, as you can imagine, have come to see Quo since I've been in the band with Rick Parfit t-shirts. And there's a lot of t-shirts that would say, rest in peace, Rick Parfit, or, you know, a, a memorial type t-shirt. And they would come down and stand right in front of me where, where they would have seen Rick. And I can understand what that must have been like like I never got to experience that because my transition was from fan to being in the band while Rick was still alive. Yeah. So not not many people know that I never got to see Rick again after the Frantic Four with, with those guys, you know, oh, the originals. Okay. So it's it, it has been, there's been some tough moments when you come out to open a show and straight away you see a fan and he's he's got his arms folded yeah. and he's just looking for the whole night. And I'm always terrified, but by the end of the night, he's asking for a plectrum or I'm getting a private message, which is just blows my mind. 
these yeah. people that you think are standing there going, this is absolute horseshit. And they're going away at the end of the night going, that was really good. Or, that was, and it's, it's trying not to annoy those people, trying not to say, this guy, Richie Malone, is, he's, he's cocky, you know, he's, it, I don't like this anymore. So it's trying to bring those old fans with us as we go as well is very important, in my opinion, yeah. you know? Right. The thing, I, the thing that I think speaks to those people is they know you're a fan too. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. They, they look at you like, well, wow, that would be, that could be me if I, you know, it's like if I was playing with Quo because they know yeah. the love you have for the band and the yeah. respect you have for it. So that trend, yeah. that means a lot. I know with Kiss fans, we got that. With Accept fans too, it's like, oh, well, the, the guy obviously is a, a fan. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. it helps. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does help. Yeah. So, yeah. um, and I wanted to, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I kind of, I mean, I was thinking about not even asking this just because I don't really pay it that much mind. Um, but, you know, we're going to get some flack from internet trolls. And I just wonder, of course. how do you, do you, how, what's your, how do you deal with it? How do you handle it? Uh, my thing is I ignore it. I don't even pay, I don't even pay it any mind. So, <laughs> would you have the same thing or what's your, uh, what's your, what's your method? Absolutely. It's, it's something again that I've battled with. Um, it, I don't think, well, there's no easy really answer to it. If there's somebody sitting at home, as I call them, keyboard warriors, yeah. you're never, you, it's like trying to change a football fan that's, that has their mindset on, on one team like Manchester United. And you come along at another team, into another team and you say, don't listen to them, listen to this, or don't, don't follow those, follow this team. That person's already tunnel vision. There is no changing their mind whatsoever. There's, you just, it's, it's a waste of time. Yeah. So with a lot of trolls I've found, they're people that are stuck in the 70s or they're stuck in the 80s. And they, so there is nothing you can do or say to change them. Right. So all I can say is, well, I'm up here and I'm traveling with the band and I'm getting paid for it. And you're sitting there on your keyboard yeah. and you're going around in circles because after you give me abuse, you're going to find the next person to give abuse to. So it, it me it, after a while you get thick skin and kind of go, well, that's, that's life. You know, there's no, yeah. but the hard thing is there's no book you can read about it either. You can't go online. You, I don't think people realize that the effect it has on you. If you, as a musician, if you go onto a message board and you see somebody giving you abuse and, and calling you names and saying, and it's, some of it can be very hurtful. Yeah. If you get sucked, if you get sucked in, I think, you know, you're going to have to learn very fast and quick if you want to be in a band on a touring level or in, 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 a, in a level of fame or whatever. It's, it comes with the job. It's, so, of, it's part of the gig now. It's, it's part of the gig, yeah. So either, you know, there's always a choice. I know a lot of people over time, a lot of famous people have become reclusive and I've, I can understand why people, you know, get very depressed. If, I can imagine or I can only imagine what it must be like to be someone like, like say, for example, Lady Gaga or somebody. Yeah. How do you deal with that level of fame? I can never imagine. I just could not imagine yeah. what it must be like to be somebody at that level where you have no privacy, you know, whatsoever. Especially now. Especially now. And yeah. everything you do now is on, as me and Leon, we're the kids in the band, as Francis says, we've come off the show or off the stage and within five minutes, within seconds, we're on Instagram from that same show. So oh, it's, yeah. it's, you know, like, it's, it's just nuts the way it works, you know? It really is. It really is. Yeah. And then and the I trolls. It started, yeah, it started getting, like, with, with Gene, everybody loved it. You know, there was nobody to mm. compare us to. And then with, with Ace, we got some flack. And then it, it didn't really bother me because I didn't really read any of it. I know guys who read everything, and I yeah, don't have yeah. the time or really care to yeah. do that. Yeah. But it kind of hit me like, okay, I, I might have made it a little bit now if yeah. I'm really pissing people off. Just yes. from being, from just doing a job, you know, yeah. not, not yeah. saying anything wrong or, 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 you know, offending anybody on purpose. Yeah. And then I kind of had the opposite I had the thing. I was like, okay, I want to do more stuff. Yes. I want to do even more shit that gets under these guys, you know, <laughs> crawl. You know, I was like, I really, yeah. want, I really want to get at them now, you yeah. know. But, um, no, that makes sense. Yeah. And again, as I say, they don't understand your journey. This, the, the trolls or whoever, keyboard warriors, they don't understand what you've possibly, and in, in my case, what I sacrificed, I didn't realize what I was sacrificing when I took the Quo gig because I'd never played at that kind of uh, stadium or arena level, you know? Yeah. So when you take a gig like this, you everything is put on hold. And that's, people don't understand. Yeah. I've, I'm, I'm missing funerals. 
I'm missing weddings, stag parties, weekends, fa- you name it, anything that comes in, I'm on the road. There's nothing I can do I, about it. I, so. I tell, I say those exact, I can get that exact statement to anybody that's any younger person that's asking like, well, what is it like? It's like, well, it's great, but you're going to miss everything, everything you said. Yeah, you know. yeah, and that, that's and you know, and originally it was obviously very special when I joined the band, but it very quickly has to become work. I didn't, I obviously four years ago I never thought I'd be still in the band this length of time, you know. Right. So um, it has to become work at some point, or you're living in a in a dreamland. You know, it, it has to be. Otherwise, I'd be every day you'd wake up and go, "Oh my God, it's Francis! Oh my God, yeah. they're white marshals!" You, you know, yeah, it has to become the new normal. And that's I know we all hate that expression at the moment, yeah. but but for me, joining Quo at some point, there had to be some kind of normality to make so I could work with these guys and become family with them. So I'm, I'm there, glad that happened. You know? Yeah, but there's a way to do that, and there still yeah. is a way to go. Of course. We're playing down down right now. Yes, and that's yeah. You know, that's the balance. It together. You know, yeah. that, was, that was always the thing with me with with Gene. Uh, playing the songs were, were great, but when we were doing a vocal together, and I'd be doing yeah. the Paul part, and he'd be doing the Gene. It's like nobody yeah. has seen this with him before besides Paul. Yeah. And that was a, that was even a more of a thing than playing guitar beside him was singing with him. Do you find mm-hmm. that too? Was when you're hard, uh, you two are singing all those great parts together. Absolutely. And, and again, when I first joined, I wasn't really doing vocals. So the more and more that I was in the band, he, Francis was pushing more vocals my way. And then obviously Rick's lead vocal on Rick's songs. Sure. So it was an absolute, you know, I was so, I still am honored whenever I get to step up to the mic and sing with Francis and, but see, now what he does is he will sit back off the mic and I'll sing the melody for him or, or we'll all sing parts that gives him a break. Yeah, so sure. it's, it's, we're designed, and people probably would think he's stepping off the mic to, to wave at a fan, but it's very, it's, it's engineered in a way that he's getting the most amount of breaths possible per songs. The guys are getting a little bit older, you yeah, know, and it's, yeah. it's a fast, heavy set for what we do, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so to, to sing with him and to look across during tracks like in the army now and stuff, I, you know, it's especially at Wacken, you know, when you hear the whole, the whole crowd singing stand up and fight yeah. and we're, we're all singing together as a unit, as a band, it's, it really is hair standing up on, on the back of your neck type thing, you know? Yeah. So I, I love the vocals in Quo always just because <laughs> they, it was so John and Paul because they were, they were, of course, sing and lead sometimes, but a lot of times they're unison and then splitting off for harmonies. It was just yeah. such a yeah. great thing. So yeah, there isn't a lot of breath for him. No. Or you at all. Like pretty much every song is. But it, yeah, it, for when you, the best way to have the set list, I think is when, and I've always admired Quo when I was watching him was three songs, three, well, between two, three or four songs as an opener and then say hello to the crowd. Yeah. And I love, right. I love that kind of a structure because there's always going to be people that come to a show that haven't seen the show before. You're always trying to convert new people, you know? Sure, sure. So to, to open with a bang, have a break, and then you have another segment, and then a, and then a medley of probably hits that goes <laughs> for 12 minutes, yeah. and then a break, and then it's the, the home stretch, as I call it. The last four or five tracks are all big hits, so it, it yeah. has to be fast, and you, you've got them in the palm of your hand. Well, they, hopefully you've got them in the palm of your hand, and home and on the bus for... Sausage rolls and tea, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so with a, I mean, talk about a fucking set list. I yeah, mean, yeah. How, do you, how do you start? I mean, you got to have some, obviously, but how do you yeah. pick? Who picks? It's, like, uh, it, is it pretty much Francis? Does he go through them all, or and, and Andy? Um, he when when I was first when originally in the band, he I would have no involvement whatsoever. Um, and the, the, the set list has always been a problem for, for Quo and for Quo fans for a long time now because there's always been, oh, it's the same old set list. Um, but the problem is, again, you go to a message board and I've, I've often seen people saying, I'd go and see them if they didn't play Rock Over the World again. And it's, you kind of have to question that person. Like the business side of it alone is, like that's like going to see the Eagles and they don't play Hotel California. or, yeah. or, or You know, I understand artists like to be big headed and have big egos and say, I'm not playing that anymore. You know, I, I don't get that. Like a lot of people are there. You play all your album tracks right up until that last bit and then hit them with the hits, you know? So sure. Yeah. For, for the quote set list, it's, it's 
the last couple of years it had become quite collaborative. We'd all have a few ideas and I had pushed to put, um, I think I had been talking about putting in Big Fat Mama, which is a Rick track. And it's quite a heavy track too. And, and I got to sing it for a few shows, but oh. and we, Backwater went back into the set for a while. Oh, cool. You know, we, we would jam and I, I would be jamming and sound check with Francis. Uh, we've done like In My Chair and, and Roadhouse Blues and, and other bits and pieces that the fans haven't heard this band playing, you know? Yeah. yeah. There, would, there would have been some big things, I think, for this year's tour if we had got to go out especially with the new album there would have been this is that's the problem we can't play for two hours but the guys can't do it anymore you know yeah. so you've got to put in a good 90 minutes pack, pack a punch or, or hit them with a, you know an hour of power and put in a few bits and pieces here and there to take it down a notch right but it's a really hard thing because you can't just throw in loads of obscure tracks and then you've got people going for a piss, you know? Exactly. exactly. So it is, to answer your question, it's a nightmare. <laughs> I can't, because when you said you got to pack a punch in 90 minutes, which is no problem for Quo mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's deciding which jabs, like, yes. Which one yeah. this one? I don't know, Little Lady or Blue Eyed, or Blue Eyed Lady. I don't know. You well, know? I would love to do, but I would absolutely love, I'm, again, I'm honored that, that I get to do Little Lady and I get to sing that one too. That's, that's absolutely astonishing for me. And I love, yeah. I really love, and I love the different guitar tunings. Being able to do the, learning how to do the, the swaps really, really quick sure, in and out yeah. of a track before it beat the click, you know. <laughs> um, but no, it's it's it is a tough task. But um, we do we do talk about it. But it it all comes down to rehearsals as well. How much time we have to rehearse? Sure. People don't understand. There's budgets involved. You have to fly everybody in, have backline as you know, and rehearse for for seven days. In that space of time, you've got to get the set list, the set back up to to a, a, an acceptable level. Yeah. and um, try to rehearse some new tracks too. So you can't just come in and overhaul the whole set is right. in a nutshell. You just can't. But there's always going to be two, three, or four tracks different and maybe di in a different orientation. Like I, I would love to open with Caroline, uh, roll over it on a paper plane. I'd love to hit those. I'd love to do those three in a row, one after the other. Yeah. Out of nowhere, you know, oh. straight, straight out of Caroline, snare hit, and in we go to roll over it down. And then a the crowd favorite with paper playing. I'd love to do that, you know. So yeah. I would, I would suggest stuff like that to Francis. But he's very clever when it comes to straights or shuffles or tunings. Where I'd be just thinking, let's do this, this, and this, and he would be telling you why you can't do this, this, and this yeah. because it's too many shuffles or it's too many straights or or too t too many tempos alike. So he's got a different take on it, you know? I get that. Gene would do that. Um, Gene mm. would reorder. We'd kind of do the same. We, we yeah. did a different set list with Gene every night. Maybe only one song different, but it was always different. But in Australia, we reordered the entire thing before one show. It was nothing was like it. We looked at it like, oh. whatever. He was 100% right. Like it was, it, it, it worked. Was, it worked. It was the greatest set ever. Like it was, <laughs> opening was shouted out loud, right into um, uh, obscure song off the Elder. But we were in Australia, so whatever. Great, you know. And the whole thing was like that. We were just playing it, going, "This is the greatest set order Brilliant. ever." It's like I guess he's learned something. You know, yeah, like, I guess he knows like, his shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the same thing. So you mentioned yeah. you mentioned the latest record, Backbone. Yeah. And and I gotta say, I listen to that one as much as I listen to any other core record. Really? I love it. Well, it's that's, great. well, that's, uh, it feels bleh, lost for words. <laughs> it sounds awesome and it feels, it has the spirit, which is the most important thing. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I think we're, screw recording gear or whatever, you can do it on whatever you want to. Uh, yeah. You got to have the vibe, I think. Yes. And, yeah. and, it, and it, it did it. And it yeah. did it. Yeah. And um, so you mentioned, you know, four years ago, not sure you're being on the band. Not yeah. only are you in the band, you're on a record. <laughs> And you got a yeah. song on it. Yeah, I know it's it's pretty. Yeah, and and again, it's gone back four years. The journey to that album between doing likes of Wacken and and the, like having live releases, they were all milestones for me. Sure. You know, to 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 get into the band and then to a live release comes out, and then as you say, four years later, it's a studio album. So it's it's mind blowing when you, when I think about it. And I I only tend to think about it the longer I'm away from the band. I realize, fuck. We really did. That was a really good four years because who knows what's going to happen now. But sure. um, but it was. It was. It was. It was a magic uh, period for the band last year. I think um, to be involved not only in the recording but the PR side of things was all new to me. 
and it was quite a big PR campaign around Backbone. So yeah. to, to, to do the album and then not knowing, not knowing how it's going to be received and then all the chart success that it had, even though it doesn't really equate to much money anymore. Right. But, you know, yourself, the and record industry. It was the first uh, quote studio record in how many years? Um, the, it was the, I think it was the first one since, uh, I could have been seven or eight years, a yeah. studio album, but it was the first, I think it was the first album to, for that chart position in, since 1982. Oh, wow. It was, it was the highest chart and co-album in the UK in, in 19, since 1982. And I think it was the highest chart and co-album in Germany ever. Oh, what? So, wow. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, although, as I say, it doesn't mean that millions of copies were sold. It was just that we, we did really well. You know, the album was really well promoted. And I suppose it was backed up with what the fans have considered some really good material. And this is where I learned about trolls. You know, you could, you couldn't, I could, I could have read... 10,000 incredible, and I've, I've read some really, some comments have really brought me to tears in, in a good way. Some, some people have wrote really lengthy comments yeah. in a good way about the album. Yeah, sure. But it only takes that one person to go, no Rick, no Quo, it's pure dog shit. Never, I've listened to it once and I threw it in a bit. You know, and it's like... Yeah, but, but you know, those guys are, it, I just, you know, there's, yeah. all, there's, there's those guys with every band. <laughs> uh, with ones that I'm in. Yes. Now, and, uh, it's like... Yeah. Whatever. I've I've, quite, I've really honestly quit caring. Yeah. Um, but but look, it 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 was. I'm 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 thanks that you've 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 enjoyed the album. You know, I'm glad you like it, and it's it's not fantastic. over the top. It's it it's nothing over the top. Um, it hasn't got mass production on it. It's it's quite a it's quite a tight album, and I I really like the sound of the album. You know, or, yeah. I'm not just saying that. I, I do. It's one of those that you can crank up. And turn it up loud, and it's got it, it gets better, you know. <laughs> yeah, it really does. It's yeah. a good loud record, and I remember because yeah. I, I mean I do follow the Quo on all the social media things, but yeah, it was really out there. Like, okay, when, yeah. When, when the, the, as far as like press, it was everywhere. You know. Yeah. Looking at it. They, yeah. They, so whoever was handling that did a, a great job. Like, yeah, that's our that's our, our label over in in Hamburg, and and like they're really nice, and and everything has been fantastic. But it's as I say. To, to be involved, especially just myself and Francis. I, again, another thing I wasn't expecting was myself and Francis did all of the radio promo and all the interviews in Germany, two yeah. days of back to back. While the rest of the band got to fly home, yeah. I was still in work, you know? So an incredible, an incredible time uh, to be in the band. It really was. And to have a couple of tracks is, you know, the icing on the cake. It's awesome. And it, I, probably that was cool for you too, doing the press, doing the press with. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah. that's pretty awesome. It, it it was and and the more I spent more time I spent with Francis, um, you learn you have to learn quick. As I say to you, it's like becoming being a fan and joining the band and have to become professional about the whole thing. Doing the PR with Francis, you've got to learn quick, or you'll be out of place. So we, I think I've seen so many interviews and it's quite funny to watch back because I I know the inside jokes that are going on between me and him, <laughs> and the poor interviewer is, you know, doesn't know what's going. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we're probably on our, on our 15th interview that day and all we can think about is going for sushi you know yeah yeah exactly so uh, but no it, it really was well, i just you know i just can't believe that it, it had got to this peak um and now all of, of of what's going on in the world it's just it's jesus christ it was it was it was airs for the taking this it year was. to do yeah, a tour know. you know so yeah i know so that, that with you guys were primed and it was like yeah uh, yeah. Did you talk about what songs you were going to add to the set? Um, fun, funnily enough, um, we, I, I, and I know Francis has openly said it on interviews, we, we were going to try to do my, my song, funnily enough, Get Out of My Head. Uh, he wanted yeah. to give that a shot. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how it would have fared off live, but it, it's, it's quite a fast, heavy track. It's a fast shuffle. Yeah. So if anything, it gives, it gives, as I said to you earlier, it gives him a breathing it gives him a breather for three, three and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. So if I'm taking a lead vocal, it's giving his voice a rest, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, the song's got to work. So we were thinking on doing Get Out of My Head and Backing Off, Off, the, off Backbone. And we were also going to try the, the song Backbone. So that would have been three songs in. Oh, wow. And straight, yeah. straight away, you see the problem now? Three songs have to go. Uh, yeah. You know, and what songs go? You know, and obviously I think songs like The Oriental, they've been in for a long time. And I know it's got a great I don't know if you're aware of the tune but it's got a great groove to it but um that probably would have went um um we probably would have tried to bring in one or two other tracks but 
yeah. until we never got to really try it out. But I think when we do get to tour again, um, we put in a good two weeks rehearsals, I'd say, and, and have to be primed and ready for it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's it. <laughs> but the time we tour again, Backbone will be years old. <laughs> you know, it's I know, like it, 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 it'll, it'll still be your latest record, but not your new <laughs> hopefully, not our last. That's the thing, yeah, because I've got because Ace's record is coming out um, this month and uh, it's a covers record. We're on we're on a tune of that, too. Oh, great. So great. We just had our last show. Uh, well, I knew it wasn't going to happen like it's a big surprise. We had one gig in October that is now right. put. So. Uh, yeah. So yeah, next year um, and the Accept record is coming out at some point, either late this year or next year or next year. Not awesome. Sure before, but on that, too. So. Fingers awesome. 2021 that we can all get back to promoting our. <laughs> yeah, I know, and and, and I again, I, I can <laughs> I can only watch the news to see what's going on across where you guys are, and it's, you know, I'd like to think the music industry is going to come back, but in Ireland, like, I'm, you know, I would say it's going to be next year, uh, late next year before anything goes ahead. I can't imagine what it's like the effect in, in, in the States or whatever. You yeah. Know? I've heard, I've heard 2022. I've heard fall of 2021. Um, yeah. so nobody really knows. And yeah, and, you know, yeah. the whole time things have been changing by the hour pretty much. Yes. And so yeah. just, I'm, I've learned it is like, you know, I'm not going to expect anything. I know yeah. this year I'm not working. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just have to accept that. Not to accept. Good one. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice to know. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so hey, I did want to have a couple more questions and I wanted to ask you about your other gig. Um, you're, a, you're a senior public engineer for an AV company. Did Wikipedia tell you that? Uh, yes, it did. It did. Well, Wikipedia is correct. All right. Uh, <laughs> yes, Actually, yes. The, uh, the Quill website told me that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's one hundred percent accurate. I, and I've two, been, I've been two internet sources told me that. Yes, it, so it must be true. <laughs> I double checked it, sir. <laughs> it's it's one hundred percent true. I, uh, oh. I, I kind of live. It's like a, a Batman lifestyle. You know, I've, I've two two careers going on at any one year, and I've been doing audiovisual since I was around sixteen or seventeen. So uh, I'm still there. I was in work today and it's, it's hectic. It's busy as hell. And it's just trying to, you know, put the music thing to one side, which I normally do when we, when we come off the road for a long period of time, sure. I try get my head back into it because um, I've always thought it's good to, from a mental point of view, you know, quo is never going to last forever. But not only that, I, I can't just sit at home for a few months and go, there's nothing to do now. I'll just chill out. Yeah. I always, I want to road, babe. What yeah, I'm up. Yeah. <laughs> I just go to work for, for a break. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's great. But how but, smart it is that you kept the gig and you do, because I also tell everybody that too. It's like the younger people, no matter what gig you have, it's yeah. going to end. Because we're yes. not, you know, you and I aren't the Steven Tyler's and Joe Perry's. Of no. Our, of no. Our band. It's going to end. And if you don't spend this time mm-hmm. cultivating something else, Whatever yeah. it is, it doesn't. It's you know something. Yeah. Else. you're gonna no, be, I agree. Be screwed. Yeah, I agree, and 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 I'm glad I did keep it because obviously, a few years ago, and you know when tours are when tours are are, are, are happening and products are coming out, obviously there's some good income to be made. Sure. But but yeah. it it drains just as quick. It you know, you when you earn a certain amount of money, you start living in a certain bracket. Then you know you don't you do things slightly different. You spend a bit more money. Mm-hmm. So for me, if I was earning more money with Quo there's more stuff getting done around the house. I've got a painter in or, or I might, you know, you buy stuff that you weren't buying before. So the more you earn, the more you're spending and there's more money going in different directions. Yeah. Now that we're off the road, I've found that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like the economy, the way it works. I'm just at home now and I can't spend this, that and the other because I have to be wise and be sensible sure. uh, because there's no income coming in from music whatsoever. Yeah. So I'm glad I kept the job and it just, if, if anything, it's always kept me grounded. That was the main thing. Don't get too carried away keep the job if, at all costs because as you say you never know what's going to happen so yeah it's, e- it's easy to see the bus and see the you know yeah. the everything and you know get yeah. guitars handed to you and played and it's like wow yeah. and, and you yeah. know it's, it, which is great yeah. it's great but you yeah. do have to have a sensible you know, yeah yeah system. obviously it's a bit difficult going back into the office or back into the job after being on the road for for a few months it really and it really is it takes 
it's even just coming home and being at home, it takes a couple of days to readjust, as you yeah. as you know, when yeah. you're away for it, just to get back into the, the normal swing of things. But to go back into the office and you've got to reprogram your brain to now think differently, you know, right. it's just because when you're on the road, you're th- you're in a different mindset, completely different mindset. Mm-hmm. So back in the office, there's a different part of the brain being tuned into, you know. So when you got the Quo gig, did your mm. business, did they revamp their uh, advertising? Policy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll bring your prices down down yes you yeah. know. <laughs> well, you want that whatever you want we got oh, it. it's 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 funny how it works because we've um we've only just rolled out a brand new uh av system in uh ucd in dublin it's one of the biggest colleges in in dublin okay. and it's a massive projection system and it's all really nice and i've managed the project recess screens and projectors pa system you name it and we did a demonstration last week with the with the customer and the clients were there. And just as we, we were about to start, this girl walked in, the client, and she says, I've just found out who you are. I'm like, oh, fuck. I've made it, I've made it through the last few months. Nobody, yeah, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't get recognized really at home. But when it comes up in conversation, it just changes the whole conversation completely. Sure. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I know it sounds bad to a lot of Quo fans, but I do try to get away from it because... It's not, I don't have it in front of me anymore. It's, I don't know when we go back. So it's kind of upsetting to not think or to know I'm not going back out soon, you know? Yeah. So yeah. she says to me, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, you, you, why didn't you tell us? I can't. And that was, that's just took the conversation for, and like all this great work we've done and all they could think about was, what, what you read the real status quo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And, then our, and then our programmer queues up a video from us in Hyde Park last year, London. There he is. That's it. And, <laughs> it's like, oh, so if anything, you know, it made for a funny day. And, oh, that's awesome. But yeah, so it has its highs and lows, you know. Oh, that's funny. So yeah. um, I did have kind of one question, and this is, the, this is the question closest to by Chris Farley. Remember when you were in the thing? So... <laughs> <laughs> you don't do that all thing. So I've got, you know, I have, I love my gigs and I've got great gigs and there's wow. um, moments in each of them, probably, you know, in every kind of, and every time we do a certain thing where I'll look over and go, holy shit, you know, yeah. or, or really yeah. get lost in it. So my question is when you guys are doing like down, down or a paper plane or one of those just barn burners, yeah, yeah. And it's coming towards the end of the tune when it just, it's a fucking locomotive. Yeah. What does that feel like being part of that? Because I think Quo does that better than anybody. ACDC's close, but mm-hmm. Quo does that complete boogie rock and roll freight train better than anybody. Yeah. What does that feel like? <laughs> being up there, part of that sound going out. I, I couldn't take it. How does it feel? It, 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 everything you've just said everything it's, it, I, and I'm glad you said down down because I know people want me to say obscure tracks but that particular track the version that we do the outro to down down when Francis kicks back in with that with that riff <laughs> yeah and, but the, the very last few bars of that track when we're all crowded around the drum kit when it's tight, you know, it, when I say it's tight, I mean it's fucking really tight. Yeah. Every, every hit is absolutely perfect and you're on the money and we're all, <laughs> you can feel it. But it's incredible because it's, it's Francis does the roll back down the neck. Leon's doing the roll all the way through on the fields and the drums. Yeah. And it's that very last bam, bang. And it's like, fuck, that was good. And I've yeah. always had that since I was a kid watching Quo. And my dad used to say best track of the night kiddo and, and I'd always be picking maybe a new song that they released and he go but fucking down down tonight kiddo down down was mind blowing you know and and I don't get to hear that anymore you know I'm see that's the thing I'm on stage yeah so I, I don't get to hear I'll never get to hear that again out the front that's another upsetting thing I'll never get to hear a quo live again from out front you yeah. know I'll never get to feel that so I do understand what you're saying well, oh, it's incredible but you're, we're, as I say, that's in the home stretch part of the set. That's that, and it rolls straight into whatever you want, rocking over the world, and then probably paper playing is the last track. So every track is a boom, 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 and then off. Oh, you know, so you always yeah. walk off on a high unless there's a technical problem. You know? Yeah, uh, the ending so, of playing too is another one of those. Just like yeah, yeah, it's just it just takes off. And it yeah, takes yeah, yeah. Part of that. 
So but I, you can tell, you can you can really feel it on some nights, as you know, when, when everybody's on fire, you can just get a certain, there's a certain groove happening in the band, everything falls into place. There yeah. are other nights when if one person's not feeling it, you can kind of get that vibe of Francis is struggling or if something's wrong with one of the other guys. Sure. You can you can get that. And then I found that someone will pick up the pace a bit. That's stuff you'll never notice from out the front. Oh, that yeah, goes on. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. It's all things. I mean, I wouldn't notice even being a musician once you guys, but you yeah. guys have your, your chemistry and your thing so dialed in that yeah. you can tell. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to do this more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, totally, yeah. I totally get that. Totally yeah. get that. But Down Down, I think that's the one you hit the nail on the head. That The outro of Down Down really is the whole band. Is, it's, it's, it's just, quite powerful. It's just so powerful. <laughs> yeah. The tuning, with, you know, what, I don't know. That's a different, the one guitar is in G and the one, gets, you know. Or, yeah, Francis is in, Francis, yeah, he's in yeah. open G tune. Yeah, Capo, Fort Fred and, and yeah. whatever. So, and I'm, I'm just playing an open to standard. So, um, but again, that's the, the beauty of the quote. It's, it's a rhythm track. There's no lead solo in Down Down. It's, it's, like, it's like paper playing. That's yeah. why I love them. They're just, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, 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 it's hard on the arm, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, we would do 40-minute sets, and I would be just like... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. And I, I couldn't get... I was trying to do that thing. Rick thing, yeah. It's yeah. Just, it's just well, you should watch... You should watch um, I thought I had it there somewhere. Rick has a, a DVD, The Rhythm Method. I think it's done by Lick Library. Oh, yeah, it's on YouTube. So, yeah, I'm still, so, yeah. I'm, st I'm still watching it going. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, no. It's just, it, it's like a bounce and it's a shuffle. It isn't just. That's it. As you said, there's a bounce. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a thing. Yeah. It's like almost like a some circular motion or some. Well, man, Richie, this has been awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for doing it. Really, really it's been fun. great. It, it's, it's taken up an hour of my time that um, I would have been just sits there at the wall anyway, you know? So <laughs> this has been most enjoyable. Well, that's awesome. Well, man, yeah. I'm hoping that we all get back and I get back over yeah. there soon. And I'd love, and anytime we're in the area, I'll let you know. And if you're home, please come yeah. out and show and Absolutely. have a, an actual real pint with you at some point. So, yeah, I'd love to be able to go in and have a pint of Guinness without having a bowl of soup, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think I take the soup. So, I, I, I take soup like too. Guinness, as, as you know, Guinness is a meal in itself. So, yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Must be damn good. Be soup. careful with the belly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well, man, have a good rest of your night, and um, we'll hope we see you down the road somewhere. I hope so. Thanks, buddy. Today's episode is brought to you by Mutt Merch.